Every hair tutorial on YouTube says the exact same thing. Don't draw a bunch of strands. Just focus on drawing one big shape. Well, okay, but what am I supposed to do with this big Banana. shape? That's what I'm going to show you in this video. Let's jump straight into how to paint straight hair. Oh, and we're also going to look at how some other artists stylize their hair. So start with a dark base color. This is supposed to be like blonde hair, so it's still pretty light. Then paint a few strokes with a lighter color where you think the light would hit. Now color pick the base color of the hair and start cutting in and out of this shape of light. I strongly recommend they use the round brush for this, specifically my round brush, which you can get for free. You should also keep your brush size as big as you can, as it forces you to simplify the shape, which ends up making it look better with less effort. So what we're doing here is painting hair using highlights. And in all the YouTube tutorials, I never heard anybody describe it this way. And I kind of wish someone did because for a long time, I really struggled with hair. I knew I was supposed to focus on the big shape and not draw a bunch of strands because that's what every YouTube tutorial says. So I would draw a big shape, but then what? The only way I knew how to add details was to draw strands. So that's what I would end up doing. It took a long time for hair to click for me. It wasn't until I studied the artwork of Zhang Jing and not just study it, but I was making a video about it. So I had to explain what I was doing. And I found that the best way to explain it was to focus on the highlights. Texture, rendering, brushwork, volume and form, all of that could come from the highlights alone. And once I started looking for these highlight shapes, I started seeing them everywhere, in art and in real life. And by just focusing on the highlights, even a very complicated hairstyle like this braid becomes digestible because the highlights give you all the information you need about the shape and the direction of the hair. Now, whether these highlights show up in real life have to do with how oily the hair is, which determines its reflectivity. Sometimes hair is a bit more dry like this, but if you zoom out, the general light shapes are still very readable, so I still use highlights to paint this hair. Although this guy's pretty rugged, so I added some white hair strands and some texture to make it look less perfect. Curly hair. I actually had this really big afro when I was a kid. I'm growing it out again, but right now I'm in this ugly in between stage. Since curly hair is so chaotic, making it look curly isn't really the hard part. It's finding good shapes and good brushwork within that chaos. So I would start by laying down a general gradient of the areas that aren't in light. And for this, you can really use whatever brush you want. You can use textured brush. Then pick a hard brush, which has size pressure, but not pressure opacity. And define a few individual curls. There are a lot of different types of curls. There's like, 3A to like 4C or some hair nerd shit, but they're all the same in terms of how you paint them. The difference is 
when you define individual curls, like some curly hair is like curly, others is like coily, and some of the curls are like really, really small. So here I was painting Miles Morales from the Spider-Man, but this was before I'd actually seen the new movie. So I kind of forgot which curly hair type he actually has, but then I realized that, so I went and redefined it into much smaller curls. Now for the most difficult hair type, wavy hair. So with wavy hair, it's both the approach for straight hair and the approach for curly hair, but at the same time, the surface is chaotic enough that it's hard to simplify into these big highlight shapes, but at the same time, with like a long flowing wavy hairstyle, there's a bit more order to the chaos compared to like a big afro. Really struggling with wavy hair, every piece just turned out mediocre. That's not good enough! Lately I've just felt like most of my art lacks passion. Uh, in, even with like some of these portraits, I was kind of bored. That's why they didn't turn out good. What I really want to do is paint these super long stories that would be like hundreds and thousands of pages, but that's like a year long commitment or something. And I would want to do those stories for the sake of doing them. I don't want, I wouldn't want to make a story like that and try to like make money from it or think about what people would think of it. I would just want to do it for fun, but right now I don't have the privilege of doing that. But I think this piece turned out okay and I had fun playing with the colors. But afterwards, I realized that this might not constitute wavy hair. I mean, I feel like there's gonna be some hair nerd in the comments being like, actually, that's hair type 1C. Um, whatever, dude. But I, I'll do another wavy hair study at the end of this video. It'll be like the final boss. Now let's study other artists to see what techniques they use to draw and paint hair. This is Ask. Now I'm obviously not going to do a full style breakdown in this video, but I'm going to try to study this piece to learn how Ask stylizes hair. Ask keeps it simple. The base color is the shadow color, and then he really uses one value for the parts of the hair that are in light. And then he adds a saturated gradation between the light and shadow. And he also has those really small and bright highlights, which give the hair an almost like metallic feeling. However, what I really wanted to capture, and I failed in this study, was the three-dimensionality, especially in those big hair strands. And to capture that, I'm gonna do an exercise which anybody can do to make their hair more three-dimensional, and that is drawing ribbons. Basically, instead of thinking of hair as flat and two-dimensional, we can visualize that as ribbons, because ribbons will curl in on themselves, and so you see both the front side and the back side of the ribbon at the same time. And Ask uses this technique to make his hair more three-dimensional. Now, we can take this a step further by adding cuts and strands. Roll the clip. Cuts and strands. If you have a shape like this, and then you cut into it with a V-shape, it suddenly feels more hair-like. And if you add some strands with that same V-shape except the other way, we'll see it gains even more hair-like quality. By adding cuts and strands to our ribbons, we can take our hair game to the next level. It really starts to feel like hair, and it's also just kind of like nice and relaxing to do these. Would only take you a couple of minutes to fill up a page in a sketchbook. And if you want your art to rely on drawing a lot, then this is definitely a great practice. I tend to rely on painting more than drawing. 
I don't even do a proper liner layer. I just paint right on my sketch because I'm lazy, but <laughs> this is still good to practice. Armed with our ribbon technique and a better understanding of the form of the hair, let's tackle another ask study. This is etc. And I love how they simplify things, including hair, but sadly they haven't posted in a while. <laughs> Now, regardless of the style you're going for, one of the most important aspects of hair is shape design. But the more you stylize and simplify hair, the more important shape design becomes. Now, my guy ended up looking kind of dumb, but uh, it'd be like that sometimes. So let's do an exercise to practice our shape design. So we're going to do a painting study only using a hard brush with no pressure opacity because without soft edges, every brush stroke you lay down very clearly creates a shape. So we're forcing ourselves to confront our shapes. We can't just hide them with the airbrush. Now, shape design is extremely complicated because good shapes don't exist in a vacuum bad shapes kind of do like if we have a shape like this we can kind of say even without context that it's overly complicated and if we were to simplify it it would be better however without context we can't say that it's good for example if we have a shape like this we might think it's a good shape because it's simple but if we were to shade the apple from before using this shape we would run into the issue of banding. Banding is when your shapes create a very obvious and unorganic gradient effect. Very icky, no good. In addition to doing studies like these, the best way to get better at shape design is by studying animation. But since this video is about hair, in this study I was more focused on capturing curly hair than just being focused on shapes. At this point, I've now seen the new Spider-Man movie, and I thought it was okay, but obviously from like artistic point of view, it's like fucking amazing, right? So once it's out online, I'll probably do a breakdown of it, probably about color, because I remember in like a few scenes while I was watching it, I remember thinking a lot about the color usage. Let's quickly go over the hairline because there's one mistake which is very common and that is thinking that the hairline starts directly under the ear but there's actually a kind of like a circle around the ear where there's no hair growth bonus tip how to paint wet hair so when hair is wet it kind of um deflates I didn't feel like making a painting from scratch for this one, so I overpainted an old piece where the hair is supposed to be wet. It actually started raining outside while I was making this video, so I recorded some of the rain sound. When hair gets wet, it becomes heavy, so the overall volume of the hair will be much smaller and it will follow the skull shape more closely. Individual hair strands will become like sticky, so they can stick to the head and the neck. Wet hair tends to become darker, but highlights become more prominent and brighter. At first I went for these really big highlight shapes, but it looked kind of weird, so I broke them up a bit since the rain and the wind would be making the hair really messy and uneven. 
I procrastinated to the very end, but it was time to head to Pinterest to meet the final box. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. I ended up choosing this reference, which I thought was very pretty. So even though in the reference there's tons of different values in the light areas, but as to not overwhelm myself, I'm keeping it simple and just using one value and distilling all of the highlights into that one value, we can add all the details and make it more complicated later. What I'm thinking about is the three-dimensional form of the hair. The light and shadow in the reference is giving me the information of when the hair is curling inwards, and when it's curling outwards. And I'm trying to explain that three-dimensional form with the most appealing shapes I can. Although I think in this piece, the shapes ended up not being the best because there's lots of small highlights here. So I made my brush small, but that just leads to unappealing shapes. From this point on, we can start adding more details, but it doesn't really get that much better from now on because this is our base. And in art, you never really make anything better than your foundation. If your foundation is pretty good, and you can pretty sure that your final piece is going to turn out pretty good. If your foundation is wonky, then your final piece is going to turn out wonky. So I added a set of even stronger highlights where the highlights are the strongest in the reference. And I also added some bounce light at the end of the hair. All in all, the shape design is kind of a mess, but art is hard. But as I said before in this video, my way of painting hair, I stole it from Sang Jing, the author of Aisha. Uh, so if you want to see the full style breakdown of her, it's, that's this video somewhere, maybe it's here, maybe it's there, I don't know, somewhere around here.